Coming up on Arirang News, a group of South Korean lawmakers head to Japan to try and resolve the two countries' trade row. Other lawmakers here at home form a group with the private sector that will work on practical countermeasures to minimize the conflict's harm to the economy. The South Korean National Security Council holds an emergency meeting over the North's launch this morning of two more ballistic missiles. It's the North's second missile launch in less than a week. And the United States is reportedly suggesting that South Korea and Japan sign a standstill agreement as a way to buy time for the two sides to work out their differences. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on our afternoon newscast. I'm Devin Whiting. North Korea fired two short-range ballistic missiles off its east coast earlier today, the second such launch in a week. And the South Korean military has shared more of its findings about today's launch. For more, we connect to our Kim ji yeon at Seoul's Defense Ministry. ji yeon the latest launch uh, seems to have a lot in common with last week's. That's right, Devin. Um, just like last Thursday, the missiles fired this morning were both short-range and ballistic and were fired from near North Korea's eastern city of Wonsan in the early hours in a northeasterly direction towards the East Sea. An official from South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said Wednesday the missiles, like last time, are presumed to have been launched using a transporter erector launcher, which is used to move missiles to a desired launch location. That means the missiles are not bound to a fixed launch site and the North's movements are therefore harder to predict. The military is still verifying where the missiles landed and said it regards today's and last week's launch to be in the test firing phase and not fully operational. What's slightly different this time, though, is the flight distance and altitude. Today's launches flew a much shorter distance than last week's, flying some 250 kilometers and reaching an altitude of around 30 kilometers, which is lower than the 50 kilometers recorded last week. This may signify that the North is trying to find ways to evade the existing Patriot missile system, which normally intercept targets at altitudes of around 40 kilometers. The military said it's monitoring North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's movements, but didn't state where he was at the time of launch, today morning's hey, launch, hey. unlike last week when the military said he could have been at the Wonsan area. It says it's currently working with the U.S. to analyze the missiles further, including their trajectory, and said the military bears in mind that today's launches could be similar to last week's. It's monitoring the situation while maintaining a defense posture in case of additional launches. To fill you in about last Thursday's firings, the military confirmed last week that the two missiles both flew some 600 kilometers and were both similar to Russia's Iskander-class ballistic missile system, which is known to be able to move away from its original trajectory to change its target or avoid being shot down. But the military also said it's capable of intercepting them with the existing Patriot anti-missile system. Devin? Well, we can expect more to come out about today's launch, but uh, you mentioned the Iskander-class ballistic missile system from Russia and that it's similar to the ones launched today. Uh, tell us more about that and why people here in South Korea are concerned about it. Well, sure. A ballistic missile which flies in an arc is uh, considered to be more lethal to, say, a cruise missile, which is a guided missile that remains in the uh, atmosphere and travels the majority of its flight path at a relatively constant speed. And anti-missile systems like the Patriot or the Terminal High Altitude Defense System that were designed to shoot down the missiles by analyzing their flight trajectory. And normally, ballistic missiles have a more complicated flying trajectory, making it harder to collect and predict data to shoot them down. Upon their descent, they drop steeply and finally hit their target vertically, sometimes by changing their angle. Also, what was noticeable about last week's launch is how the military have pointed out the so-called pull-up maneuver in the missile's final dive phase as the main reason it took a day to finalize the missile's flight distance. It had initially pre presumed last Thursday's missiles have flown some 430 and 690 kilometers last Thursday, but then corrected them to have flown 600 kilometers the following day. Back to you, Devin. All right, thank you for that. Kim ji yeon from the Defense Ministry here in Seoul. Now, South Korea's presidential office has expressed deep concern about North Korea's missile launches. According to the Blue House, an emergency meeting of the National Security Council was held this morning in which the members of the standing committee agreed that the missile launches could damage efforts for peace on the peninsula. 
Seoul, they said, will ramp up its military ready readiness while closely monitoring the situation. The members also promised to continue their diplomatic efforts with the North, as seen in last month's meeting at the border village of Panmunjom. Also speaking on the trade row between Seoul and Tokyo, the NSC vowed to use all possible means to deal with Japan's export curbs that took effect at the start of July. A spokesperson for the U.S. military in South Korea says they are aware of reports of North Korea's missile launch and that U.S. forces will continue to monitor the situation. Meanwhile, Japan's defense ministry said in a statement on Wednesday that the missiles did not reach Japanese territory and therefore had no impact on Japan's security. Regarding last week's missile launches, Japan's defense minister called them regrettable and said they violate U.N. resolutions. President Trump brushed off North Korea's missile launches last week as no big deal. Again on Tuesday, he was saying his relationship with Kim Jong-un is very good. But that was before this morning's missile launches. Kim yo sun has this report. President Trump is again emphasizing his close relationship with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, adding we will see what happens with the regime. Speaking to reporters at the White House on Tuesday, Trump said his relationship with Kim is, quote, a very good one. He also said he can't speak in detail about what is going to happen. Referring to former Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton, President Trump said if she had won the 2016 election, the U.S. would be in a major war with the North right now. The comments come after Pyongyang fired two short-range ballistic missiles last week, after which Trump insisted he was not at all alarmed by the move. Meanwhile, it has emerged that an official of the White House National Security Council traveled to the DMZ last week to deliver photos to the North of the June 30th encounter between Kim and Trump at the inter-Korean border. According to Reuters, a North Korean official also says working-level denuclearization talks between the two sides will start very soon. The news agency also reported the two parties may have already discussed detailed measures to revive talks at the working level. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. South Korea has launched a new consultation body made up of lawmakers, government officials and representatives of the private sector to deal with Japan's growing restrictions on trade with South Korea. After a closed-door meeting on Wednesday, Seoul's finance minister, Hong Nam-gi, who is the body's co-leader, said that they're preparing measures for all possible scenarios, especially with Tokyo getting ready to expand its trade restrictions on Seoul. Hong said that the participants agreed that first and foremost is to minimize the impact on local companies. They promised to come up with both long-term and short-term plans to boost the competitiveness of South Korea's parts and materials industries and to promote localization. He also stressed the need to seek a diplomatic solution, which would include boosting cooperation with the international community. A group of South Korean lawmakers have arrived in Japan for a two-day visit, during which the 10 members will urge Japan to lift its export curbs and scrap plans to remove South Korea from its list of countries that face minimal trade restrictions. The delegation said they hope to serve as a bridge to a diplomatic solution. Take a listen. Our delegation will meet with lawmakers of both Japan's ruling and opposition parties to discuss our positions on the matter and prevent the situation from taking a turn for the worse. We are planning to deliver the message that we want to cooperate to resolve the issue diplomatically. The delegation has a string of meetings lined up with Japanese lawmakers and parliamentary officials. First up was a working lunch with Fukushiro Nugaka, chief of a parliamentarian's union between the two countries and a lawmaker for Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party. Also another highly anticipated agenda today is a meeting with Toshihiro Nikai, secretary general of the ruling party who is known to be close to Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. And it seems the U.S. might finally be stepping in to try and resolve the trade row. With the top diplomats of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan expected to hold three-way talks in the coming days. The U.S. is reportedly suggesting they sign a standstill agreement. Oh Jung-hee explains. In a bid to give South Korea and Japan time to thrash out their differences, the U.S. has urged the two countries to sign a standstill agreement. This, according to Reuters on Tuesday, citing a senior U.S. official. 
It's deemed highly likely Japan will start the process of removing South Korea from its exports whitelist at a cabinet meeting set for Friday. The U.S. official said the standstill agreement would not help narrow the differences between the two sides, but would prevent further actions taking place for a set period of time to allow talks to happen. The length of the agreement has not yet been determined. This means Washington is looking to get involved and mediate this whole Tokyo trade spat. Until now, the U.S. has been cautious, saying the issue needs to be solved by the two countries themselves, and it's difficult for the U.S. to side with one country over the other, as both are key allies in the region. On top of the proposed standstill agreement, a trilateral meeting among the top diplomats of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan will happen this week on the sidelines of the ASEAN Regional Forum. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo confirmed that fact on his way to the forum's host city, Bangkok. He said after meeting with his South Korean and Japanese counterparts one-on-one, he'll meet with them together and encourage them to find a way forward. Meanwhile, Seoul's Foreign Minister Kang Kyung-hwa is continuing to stress how unjustified Tokyo's export curves are. Leaving for Bangkok on Wednesday, she said, I think it's important to clearly let the international community and the many foreign ministers attending the ARF know that these restrictions imposed by Japan are unjust and should stop. Washington is concerned the trade dispute could end up hurting their trilateral coordination in dealing with North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. Reuters also reports the U.S. is closely watching what Seoul will do with an intelligence-sharing agreement between Seoul and Tokyo. The deal automatically renews on August 24th, but the South Korean government has hinted it could terminate the agreement under certain circumstances. Oh jung Arirang News. It's time now for an in-depth look at the global markets on this Wednesday, and for that I'm joined on the line by Dr. Hwang se Research Fellow at the Korea Capital Market Institute. Dr. Hwang, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me today, too. So investors are apparently anxious about the U.S.-China trade talks that started yesterday in Shanghai, and that sent Wall Street lower on Tuesday. Korean stocks were also sharply lower this afternoon. What's the story uh, today here and globally? In Wall Street, the stocks finished lower Tuesday after President Donald Trump renewed his attacks on China, decreasing hopes that the two largest world economies will reach a trade deal. Traders are also braced for a key announcement on U.S. monetary policy. Though a new round of U.S.-China trade negotiations started in Shanghai, the outcome could be no agreement or a harsher one. This puts ongoing pressure on the equity market. Traders also looked to the start of Federal Reserve monetary policy meeting. The expected easing has supported risk asset prices worldwide so far. Asian shares also weakened on Wednesday, rattled by fresh trade war concerns following threats from President Donald Trump to Beijing. Trump's comments suggest that U.S.-China trade negotiations are not going well, which is a new negative factor for the markets. Japan's Nikkei uh, dropped 0.86%, while South Korea's Kospi declined 0.69% as of close. Well, now it's July 31st, and so the Federal Reserve will be deciding on interest rates in a matter of hours, uh, widely expecting a cut of 25 basis points, uh, which would, President Trump says would not be enough. What do you think the decision will be? The U.S. Federal Reserve is widely expected to cut interest rates for the first time since the financial crisis more than a decade ago. Market expectations point to a quarter-point rate cut. I expect that U.S. Federal Reserve policymakers will not surprise markets this time. Investors will also look for clues from Powell about potential rate cuts later this year. Currently, traders are pricing in at least two rate cuts of 25 basis points before the end of the year. Less clear is how Fed Chairman Jerome Powell will manage debate at the central bank about whether the stimulus is necessary. 
The Fed chief faces a strong possibility that the move will draw at least one dissent. With Powell already under attack by U.S. President Donald Trump for not doing enough to boost the economy, he could find his decision-making even more difficult if some of the board members do not want to ease the monetary policy. Got it. We're back to the U.S.-China trade talks in Shanghai. Both sides still far apart on their demands, uh, the main ones especially, and this is the first time they've met in about three months. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there? Expectations for a breakthrough in the trade talks remain low. The two sides are further apart than they were three months ago when negotiations broke down and each side blamed the other for derailing attempts to reach a deal. The Shanghai talks were expected to center on goodwill gestures, such as Chinese com commitment to purchase U.S. agricultural commodities and steps by the United States to ease some sanctions on Chinese telecom equipment giant Huawei Technologies. However, as U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin landed in the Chinese commercial hub on Tuesday, Trump accused Beijing on Twitter of stalling and warned of worse outcome for China if it continued to do so. In contrast, China is pushing for a compromise in the talks with state media underlining this week that the U.S. should meet in halfway. This will lower the possibility to reach a deal on the negotiation tra table. All right, Dr. Huang, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for coming on, as always. Uh, thank you very much. Now, the world's biggest smartphone maker, Samsung Electronics, has released its earnings for the second quarter. Samsung still made money, but its semiconductor profits were down more than 70 percent. Kim Dami has the details. Samsung Electronics' profits from its semiconductor business plunged in the second quarter by more than 70 percent from a year earlier, mainly due to low memory chip prices. The company said Wednesday that it made just 2.88 billion U.S. dollars on chips. It's the lowest figure in five years. Sales fell 4 percent to around $47 billion, and Samsung's profits overall were down almost 56 percent from a year earlier. The firm pointed to a falling global demand for memory chips, especially from China, and falling prices for DRAM. Samsung's performance in the three-month period was slightly better, however, than it had a forecast earlier this month. The tech giant also denied rumors that it will reduce its memory chip production. Still, experts say a growing uncertainties caused by Japan's export curbs means Samsung will continue to face pressure. Samsung has reportedly secured emergency stockpiles that can last up to three months so its production will be fine until September. But if Japan decides to start rejecting applications for export to South Korea, Samsung's production will be affected starting as soon as the last quarter of this year. Meanwhile, there was a turnaround in Samsung's display business with a 7 percent jump in sales and an almost 6 percent jump in operating profits. Despite a slowdown in the market for small to medium-sized displays, the company said new iPhones to be released will help it in the second half of the year. Sales in Samsung's IT mobile business, including smartphones, rose almost 8 percent on-year with a boost from low- and mid-priced products. That was hampered, though, by tougher competition in that price range and higher marketing costs. Home appliances saw the biggest on-year improvement with profits and sales up 30 percent and 6 percent respectively, thanks to sales of OLED TVs and air conditioners. Kim Dami, Arirang News. South Korea's industrial output fell again in June, adding to the already low overall production figure from May amid reduced production in the nation's service sector. Lee Min Sun reports. South Korea's overall industrial output fell 0.7 percent in June compared to a month earlier due to slumping production in the service sectors.
Data released by Statistics Korea show industrial production rose 0.9% in April on month and edged down 0.3% in May. June's production was down for the second straight month and it's the worst it has been since February when the figure plunged 1.9%, which was the biggest drop in six years. By sector, production in the service sector shed 1% on month in June, while manufacturing production edged up 0.2%. That was due to a 4.6% increase in semiconductor production that centered a 3.3% decline in auto production. However, the total figure was still 2.9% lower than the overall output seen in the manufacturing sector in June 2018. Retail sales also dropped 1.6% in June due to falling car and clothing sales. Facility investment rose 0.4% in June due to increased imports of semiconductor manufacturing equipment and transportation equipment. Statistics Korea says the increase in facility investment in June was due to a big slump in May, but it was still down from a year earlier. In addition, economic output indicators have been negative since March. Lee min Sun, Arirang News. On the Korean stock market, the number of companies worth more than 800 million U.S. dollars, or 1 trillion won, has fallen this month by the biggest margin since last October. According to the Korea Exchange, the Kospi has seven fewer trillion won firms than the month before, and the Kosdaq now has five fewer. There are now just 186 of them in total. Their numbers have been steadily declining since February. Industry sources say this is due mainly to the prolonged trade and tensions between the U.S. and China and the ongoing trade row between South Korea and Japan. For the first time since May, the U.S. and China are meeting in Shanghai to talk trade, but it seems little headway was made on day one. Lee Seung Jae reports. U.S. and Chinese negotiators resumed trade talks in Shanghai on Tuesday hoping to take steps to rebuild trust on numerous key issues. Washington's delegation, led by U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, had dinner with the Chinese delegation headed by Chinese Vice Premier Liu He. During their brief discussions, the U.S. side looked to pick up Chinese orders for American farm goods, while the Chinese pressed Washington to relax U.S. restrictions on Huawei's access to American technology. However, sources say little to no progress was made at the dinner. President Trump put pressure on Beijing to swiftly reach a deal in a series of tweets on Tuesday morning, warning that if he's re-elected next year, the terms of the agreement will be much tougher than now, or there may be no deal at all. The trade war, which began last summer, has depressed trade between the two economic superpowers. U.S. exports to China tumbled more than 30 percent on year in June, while imports from China decreased by nearly 8 percent. However, watchers are more optimistic this time around, saying the selection of Shanghai as the location for the talks could be a signal of China's willingness to strike a deal. They base this on the fact that 12 years ago, China and the European Union agreed to a deal in Shanghai that ended a temporary curb on Chinese textile exports to the EU. Despite the lack of progress, there's hope for some kind of breakthrough on Wednesday, when more formal talks take place at a government guest house in Shanghai. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Korean football fans were angered last week when superstar Cristiano Ronaldo decided not to take the field when his team Juventus played a friendly against the K-League All-Stars. Some of them are suing, saying they didn't get what they paid for. Won Jung Hwan reports. Frustration and anger have boiled over among many Korean fans. Cristiano Ronaldo stayed on the bench for the entire exhibition match last Friday at a packed Seoul World Cup stadium. They had been promised that Ronaldo would play at least 45 minutes. He didn't, so thousands have decided to sue. Local law firm Myung-an says those who bought the expensive tickets were not treated in the way they expected or deserved due to Ronaldo's absence from the field. Fans bought these expensive tickets because they believe Ronaldo would be playing and that's why we are demanding compensation because many fans believe they were cheated. The law firm says more than 2,400 people have joined its suit as of Tuesday, 
and they expect many more to join as they continue to sign up plaintiffs through the next week. It's not just compensation for the tickets they want. Another law firm is seeking criminal charges of fraud against Ronaldo himself, Juventus, and the organizer, a company called The Festa, claiming they misled fans into believing Ronaldo would play. A prosecutor turned attorney claims the agency knew Ronaldo would not play, but hid that information to defraud around 65,000 fans of over 5 million US dollars. I believe there are enough evidence on the case to be stated as fraud, especially considering that the organizer knew that there was a chance that Ronaldo could not show up during the match. Fraud can be recognized if we can find evidence that the organizers still continue to sell tickets even if they knew. Meanwhile, South Korea's professional football governing body, K-League, sent a letter of protest to the Italian champions for violating the contract. The K-League said in a press briefing Tuesday that Juventus threatened to cancel the match if it wasn't shortened or delayed by an hour. The game was eventually delayed by 57 minutes. The K-League hasn't revealed who made the threat, but according to some inside reports, it was the legendary Juventus player and its current vice chairman, Pavel Nedved. Won Juan, Arirang News. And that does it for this hour. Thank you for watching.